Hello, and welcome to the Fairwinds Energy Education Film Series. In today's film, Maggie Gunderson joins Margaret Harrington on Nuclear Free Future. This is Burlington, and here we are in the Channel 17 newsroom for our ongoing Nuclear Free Future conversation. I'm your host, Margaret Harrington, and I'm happy on the viewer's behalf to welcome Maggie Gunderson, the founder and president of Fairwinds Energy Education, centered right here in Burlington, Vermont. Thank you, Maggie, for being my guest today. Thank you, Margaret, for having me. I, I always love doing this show with you. Yes, and it's true. You have come to this, this program several times, always giving us vital information that we need in the field of, of nuclear education. So could you explain for our viewers and for me again what exactly uh, Fairwinds Energy Education is and what you do? Fairwinds Ed Energy Education is a 501c3 nonprofit. And all of our um, funds come from individual donors, from uh, foundations and grantors. So that's what it means to have a 501c3 and that the IRS gives us a tax status and any donations can be tax deductible. Our mission is to educate people all around the world about nuclear power um, risk, nuclear power safety issues, nuclear uh, power operations. We've done a, a research on nuclear plants all over the United States and all overseas. We spent considerable time and continue reviewing everything that happened at the accident at Fuku Fukushima. Daiichi. Yes, and to refresh our memory, Maggie, that date was 2011, so we're going into the third year. Yes, and things are as bad as many of us, many experts, had anticipated. Now, when you're talking about experts, uh, for our viewers, let's remind ourselves that uh, Arnie Gunderson, your husband, is the, is the chief engineer for Fairwinds Energy Education. Yes, and for our expert witness firm, which is Fairwinds Associates, and that's where uh, we do the testimony through that branch. We work for interveners on cases and, and go state governments. Uh, we've done significant work for the state of Vermont, um, some of the prefects uh, in Japan, some of the uh, provinces in Canada. Uh, so we have clients all over the world and um, work on analyses that show what might be wrong at a nuclear plant. Uh, for example, last year, one of the cases we did was San Onofre. Um, and the San Onofre nuclear plants have closed down because they did not um, correctly design their um, steam generators. And the result of that was that they started leaking radiation and were a safety threat to the people of Southern California. So, and that was, Arnie, Arnie Gunderson then testified to, yes. to what agent? Was it to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission? Yes, he testified to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and to several uh, city councils and county governments in California. Um, he did five expert reports, yeah. and we did together. We met in the nuclear industry. Arnie was the lead engineer on a nuclear project, and I was in charge of public relations for that project, and, and that's how we met, so. That's quite a turnaround, Maggie Gunderson, isn't it? I mean, you were, you, were on be, you were speaking on behalf of the nuclear power industry. I was. I was speaking in upstate New York, uh, near Lake Ontario, uh, where there was a proposed nuclear power plant site, and I had come from one of the nuclear vendors, Combustion Engineering, which has since closed. It's a vendor, like General Electric is a vendor who designed and built the Fukushima Daiichi plants. Mm. And I um, worked for that vendor in an area called nuclear reload core design. So every um, year to 18 months, depending on the size of the plant, the plant has to be shut down in order to put new fuel in. And I worked in that group um, with engineers for combustion engineering. 
doing public relations. Doing calculations first, and then afterwards, uh, combustion engineering recommended me for the job in nuclear public relations, and so I, I went ahead and I took that job up in Oswego, New York. And what did that involve? Which, uh, which people did you want to reach with the public relations? We wanted to reach the county. We wanted to reach the government of New York State. We wanted to reach uh, the people who were living there. I did a lot of one-on-one um, -on -one conversations with people near the plant. So it was an interesting, an interesting job. I love the area and I love the people up there. And, you know, I was telling them that the plants were safe because that's what I had been taught. That's what um, the industry, that's the myth, one of the myths that the industry perpetuates. Mm. Did that power plant, was that power plant built in Oswego? It wasn't, and the reason was Governor Carey, when he was governor of New York State, uh, put a stop to any more nuclear power plants, and this was, oh, 1976 or 77 that he's, I think it was 77 that he stopped it, um, maybe even 78, yeah, 78. Was, what was the, uh, the, the reason wh why he stopped it, do you know? He stopped it in 1978 because he won to make sure that there was a repository for the waste. And here we are, and there is still no methodology. It's not just that there's not a place. There's no methodology that works mm. to contain all this waste. But now, there's so much more. Exactly. And uh, when you speak of nuclear waste, we're, we're talking about that failed repository out west, which... Uh, Yucca, which has, Mountain. Yucca Mountain, which has not come to be, and also uh, what's called Mobile Chernobyl. What What is that? Do you, Mo, Mobile Chernobyl? It's, it's the, toting around the nuclear waste all across the country to different places. There are different waste repositories that they're still trying to put in now. What concerns me with any nuclear waste, if we look at Hanford, for example, which is a Department of Energy site, uh, that has nuclear plants also, as well as manufactured weapons. Um, there's waste leaking everywhere. There is literally no way to contain it. Um, in South Carolina, which is a waste repository for both commercial waste at Barnwell and um, nuclear Department of Energy waste also, that it's terrible because tritium is moving in a wedge, as it did on, on the Vermont Yankee site, towards, in, in um, South Carolina, it's towards uh, the Savannah River, and in, um, you know, in Vermont, it was towards the Connecticut River. And tritium is sort of, it moves ahead of any other radioactive isotopes. So, here it is, all these years later, I mean... 50 years later, and there's still no solution mm. where to store the waste. Maggie, can you tell me what awakened you to turn around completely to, in the opposite direction about nuclear power? Um, there were several things. One of the first things was um, getting to know uh, Dr. Helen Caldicott, and she had come to speak at University of Vermont. And she validated a lot of things that I had been finding in research for different clients. Um, the research was showing that the nuclear industry does not have control or even an idea of what's really escaping from operating nuclear power plants, and they don't know how to manage the waste. So those two things. She spoke to me about tritium particularly. And um, the first time I spent considerable time with her, was on a show that you had us both on, so That's that, was, that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And what she found is that there's new science, new 10 years old, 15 years old, so not that recent, that shows that tritium stays in the body for more than a year and that it crosses the placental barrier and can do damage to a fetus and that it um, also can impair organs. And the industry, 
the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says that tritium is not threatened and that it passes through people like water. And it's not true. So one of the concerns that, that we have and, and, and we face is that tritium always um, is treated by the, by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as if it, it's non-invasive and it doesn't matter. And the regulators just are not up to date on the current science that shows that, that it's very harmful for human health. So that first turned me, and Arnie still um, was very, very pro-nuclear until the accident at Fukushima Daiichi. And then he believed, he was so shocked that um, every single safety system failed. Maggie, are, are you, you're jumping from the, the Three Mile Island? Because oh, I know that he, he, Arnie Gunderson, testified at, at Three Mile Island, right? Yes, yes. Arnie was um, the expert witness in the plaintiff's case on Three Mile Island. And um, he showed that significant radiation was released. And at the 30th anniversary of Three Mile Island, Dr. Steve Wing, who's an epidemiologist, came there to speak. And Arnie, they were both brought to the Pennsylvania State House to speak in Harrisburg. And they had never met before. And they had never looked at each other's work. And it, both of their work fit together perfectly. It was really a surprise for all of us. Because Steve um, had all these epidemiological studies that showed cancers around Three Mile Island. And Arnie showed a significant amount of radiation came out, his studies, and Steve's studies, they, they went together, they fit together, where the NRC has denied that there was significant radiation release. Now this year, um, we have been invited, Arnie's been invited to speak at TMI 35, and that is the 35th anniversary of the accident at Three Mile Island, and Arnie is giving the keynote at um, Penn State, which is hosting the event. It's a two-day symposium. So just the fact that Arnie Gunderson has been invited to do that shows something of a turnaround in the, uh, the awareness of what, how damaging nuclear power plants can be to the people and the environment. Yes. In, in this, even in the five years. Yes. Young. So, so it's all coming together for me and, and my, my viewers also about what your mission is with Fairwinds. It's for the education, energy education, to wake us up about the, the dangers and, and also what can be done about it. Yes. Besides uh, awakening us. That's uh, right. That's right. And it's, um, I, I like the team we have. You've had some of our team members on the show. Our media director, Nathaniel White-Joyle, and um, Arnie and, and me, and, and now our new director of operations, Maura O'Neill, started in November. And it's, it's a great team. Everybody brings unique skills, and, um, you know, we just, we have a really good, a group of viewers, or I guess you could call them members, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. who um, write to us and ask lots of questions. And, and we respond via video, um, podcasts that are audios, and also in blogs. Right. So, and you keep us up to speed on what is going on in the nuclear power industry. We're trying because there's so much... Um, I don't know who coined the word years and years ago, it's an, and I should look that up, but there's so much nuke speak that the industry uses. And people say, what does this mean? What does it mean when a, a nuclear plant goes critical? That sounds like it's going to explode. Well, actually, that's when the reaction is producing energy. You know, so mm -hmm. the, the terminology is a way, I think, to... Um, Put a veil over the truth of what's happening, and we try to get get that out there. 
Of course, because to talk nuclear or to do news, news speak, uh, news speak. Is, is supposed to be a, a world that most of us cannot enter, especially the lay person, the non-scientific person. And we are left either with the silence that the media gives all of these questions, these critical questions, or else with denials of the dangers of, of nuclear power. And uh, the reputation of Helen Caldicott has been assailed throughout the decades that she has worked to awaken us, our, our awareness of, of the dangers of nuclear power. She has been constantly pummeled by the press, by the media. And yes. um, There are some people who have targeted her ex expressly, and they, they are people who have worked for the industry for years and years and years. And, you know, I think the media needs to ask them, well, and, and look further and say, how much are these people getting paid? What are they invested in? You know, why, why are they writing this? There was um, a piece that came out, I think it was three days ago, in Forbes magazine, that's just outrageous on what it says about Fukushima and that nothing happened and radiation is fine. And, and the gentleman who wrote that um, is a lobbyist and has worked in the nuclear industry for 35 or 40 years and he worked at the Hanford site and he's been tied into all these things and the day that the accident was happening at Fukushima Daiichi he was giving testimony in Washington State in the legislature and his quote I don't remember it exactly but it was something to the effect of nuclear power, operating a nuclear power plant is as safe as running Toys R Us. You know, so, I mean, the, the leaps are absurd or that when people say, oh, if you eat bananas, you're getting radiation. Yes, there is radiation in bananas. And it's natural. But it's not the man-made generated radiation that's at Fukushima Daiichi or near other nuclear plants that causes cancers. It just isn't. So would you lay that denial of, of the dangers, or the more than dangers, of, of nuclear power at the feet of, of the money to be made from, sure. from this, this in, the nuclear power industry? And why does Forbes give this man, he has a column in there all the time, so why does Forbes magazine, unless you look back at what was, um, uh, it, used, it used to be called the capitalist tool, you know. So, so if Forbes magazine is part of this corporate structure and they're looking for how they help industry and they help corporations mm -hmm. again and again and again. And, and that's investment. They're not looking at the scientific truth and yet... I saw seven, eight, ten media outlets quote this article, and it's simply not true. Mm. So I, I see what the need for Fairwinds Energy Education and for the fact, the fact that you and Arnie have gone around the world also in giving testimony, including at, at, in Japan. Arnie, and Arnie also wrote a book that is in Japanese, and is it, has it been translated into English yet about the dangers of the power plant? No, there. Um, I have the rights to the book in English, and two years ago, um, February 9th, I was in a car accident and had a concussion, and I was in the process, that's exactly when the book was being released in, in Japanese, because that's where we went first to make it available to the Japanese people. And the publisher was working with me on uh, doing an English version, and I wasn't able to bring it to fruition. I, you know, I'm starting back on it now, and uh, it was number four. Uh, I'm sorry, it, for four months, it was number one on the Japanese um, Amazon bestseller list for uh, nonfiction, and. Um, it's it's sold many 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 copies and it's a it's a wonderful
And can you give me some idea of what what is in it? It went detail through detail um, how the plant was originally designed and built, and then what happened at the accident and why these systems failed. So it's it's an interesting and what happened, you know, in terms of. Uh, with the Prime Minister and what he was trying to do and, and not being able to protect the people adequately. Um, it's, it's, it's a sad book. It has, mm. you know, it's very sad when you read it, but it's, it's true. Yes. But it's very factual. And all, there, all the time there is inform, new information about Fukushima coming out and then set aside by, by the media. Isn't that so about the, the ongoing dangers? And at the same time, there is what is presented as a problem in Japan that the nuclear power reactors are not being uh, set into motion again. So. Well, two things just came up this week. TEPCO just announced that all the data it collected for almost three years is wrong and that they had miscalculated how much radiation was released. A lot of people are stepping forward and saying, you know, was some of that done in order to um, make sure that Tokyo got the Olympic bid? I don't know. I can't answer that. And then uh, just this week, and, and I think there's a press conference today in Atlanta about it, um, Union of Concerned Scientists released a new book called Fukushima, The Story of a Nuclear Disaster. And it's by Ed Lyman and Dave Lockbaum with Union of Concerned Scientists. And they've reviewed the accident in detail. I haven't read it yet. It's next on Fairwind's book list. And we'll, we'll look at that in detail. Um, when you say it's next on Fairwind's book list, what is that, Maggie? Every month we feature a new book that we're reading, that members of our team are reading, that has to do with energy or nuclear power. And we have quite a book list up on the site. We were, uh, for six months, we had been doing it uh, weekly. But people were telling us it was too, that it was moving too fast. Please leave it up there longer. So we're doing it monthly. And um, we detail all different books, from some of Helen Caldicott's books to Power Struggle, which is a book about um, how um, power lines were originally done in energy, you know, to um, the tipping point, which a Vermont author that you had on, um, Mark Pendergrass wrote, yes, you know, yes. which was about Japan and its opportunities uh, to move on to renewable energy. Uh, so we featured we we featured some of Amory Lovin's work, and he has been on our video for an interview with Arnie. So there's there's just a really uh, it's a good selection. And I hope, Maggie, that with this program, too, that your audience grows, because we, we do need to know what more about what's going on, and I thank you so much for, for educating us in this. So I thank you so much for hosting us all the time and, and having us on. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Maggie. Until next time, and for our viewers, thank you for watching, and thank you, Maggie Gunderson from Fairwinds Energy Education. Goodbye for now.